Hello, good day, and welcome back to the second video on using GoFiber. See, if you haven't watched the first video, here's the link to that. Check it out. So, assuming that you're all caught up, what are we going to be doing today? Today, I want to show you some of the properties that you can need to set to configure your GoFiber application. For the GoFiber application is the thing that you create when you say fiber.new. So, we're going to look at that. So, let's jump in. So last video, we started on the welcome screen for GoFiber and the website is gofiber.io. And we show as though it's an express um, inspired framework and it's pretty simple to get started by just calling fiber.new that creates an application, which is called a fiber application. And then you just attach roads to it. Today, I want to dive a bit into um, this new function and the configure value. Now, if you look on my screen to the top left, or if you go to the website for GoFiber, you'll see once you click on Fiber um, you, on the API, you'll see it all the Fiber package exposes four things, three functions and one type. The three functions are the new functions that we use, which is Fiber.new, there's new error, and then there is child. I'll explain those later as we go down to the bottom, but most of the time you're not gonna really need those. And the last thing is the config type, which is what goes with that new function. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So here are some of the fields for that config um, type. As you can see, there's application name, body limit, case sensitivity, and so on. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I didn't come to see how many fields they are, but as I talk, I'll scroll through the entire list here. And you'll see there quite a number of them. And I think most of them you don't really need to use in most of your application. There are a few corner cases for some sort of applications where you might have to set some of these, or you might want to set some of these, but for the most part, most of them have sensible defaults. For some of the ones that you might want to change that are, I think are useful, I'm going to show you, or a few I'm going to show you that are why you might not want to set it. So that is what the intent for this video is. And I want to keep it nice and short, so I, that's why I can go through every single property and explain it. All right. Um, I encourage you to look at the properties yourself and, again, glance through them, and you'll see some of them are just going to make sense of what you might want to set. For your application so the function new error takes an error code as an int and a message as a string one or more messages as a string and because we see message there is a variadic parameter on string so you can pass multiple messages and that just simply allow us to return a more detailed error message with a or custom error code um, you're most likely not going to use it but if you need to it's there for you the last one is is child, and it says here the documentation is child determine if the current process is a result of pre fork. Now, now for people who have done system programming in Linux, you know it all. There's the fork call which forks a process, and you have the parent and then the child, and so there's a test to see if because the fork process one gets um, a one, the other one gets a zero you can tell which one is the parent and which one is the child. And so that's why this is used. I'm going to show you what pre-fork is. And from above, it talks about how if you set pre-fork to true, pre-fork is this ability of the Go Fiber to spin up multiple processes, essentially as Go Routine, to listen to the same port. Generally, you can have more than one process listening to the same port. But with this capability of Linux, you can have multiple processes, in this case, as GoRoutine, listening to the same port. Now, the thing is, you might have a use case in which you want to do something different in the parent process versus one of the child process. And this is where the fiber that is child function comes in handy. And as you can see in the example below there, they can print out different methods, they can print out a message depending if it's a parent or a child. But once again, I don't think most people are gonna need to use something like this. Okay, with that said now, let's jump into looking at the, some of the properties that I do think 
are things that you might want to be able to know about and possibly use. So here I am on my command line. I'm going to copy our last um, episode code. So that's going to be episode one. I'm copying it to episode two. Go into the episode two directory. I'm going to start up my VS Code editor, Codium. And then I'm going to get rid of our first example. Our first example is really using HTTP packet, and I don't want that. So I'm going to start with our exam exercise two and just rename it to exercise one. Once I go into this directory, remember I have uh, my task file, so I can just start running. I can do watch on my dev task and have it start up and listen in. Now we'll come back to the what the printout is when you start up a Google Fiber application. But for now, let me just get rid of all the stuff I don't need. So I don't need this application to be able to handle multiple requests or anything. It's simply going to handle one request, which is get. And I don't need to do anything like JSON document or anything. So I'm going to get rid of all these extra handlers. So I'm just going to have this one get handler on the slash um, path. And all I wanted to do is print out request receive as a log message and also returned a nil error. Nil error meaning no error. So I should automatically get the HTTP OK. And once I've sort of modified my um, application to do just that, that's it. It's done. So this is the result. So okay, this looks good. I'm happy with this. And our application is once again functional and running. All right, so let's just test it out. So we can send a request and we can see what we get back. And of course, we expect that oh, we're going to get back um, just it should be OK. And that's what we get. And we didn't write anything back, so we don't see anything. All right, good. So that looks good. All right. So what is the first thing we want to do? So remember, we're just testing out all the different config values. So let's create a value for our configuration, and then we'll pass that into new. So this is going to be fiber config, and that's it. And later on, we'll come back and add some different configure different fields. So right now, this is no different than what we had before. So the first one I want to look at is app name. And so if we set an app name, let's say, for example, my awesome app, for example, version, whatever. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that it's already start updating to show my app name. And by default, even if, if I don't put an app name, I still get the fiber version, the port is listening on, and all these other things. But I get this extra line if I put in the app name. So that seems pretty cool. So I'm going to keep that. The next property I want to set is going to be enable print routes. Now, I'm going to set this to true, and you're going to see that what this does is it showed me a list of all the routes I have configured and the handler. So it shows me the method I have for each path and name and then the handler. It just basically tells you what the, um, the name of that handler function is. Now, notice how name is empty. So how can we set a name for our particular route? So that's easy. So when we call our app that method name, so in this case, have that get, and then we pass the path and then the handling function, that return value also has a method on it called name. And if we set that, you can see that how it sets a name. Now you might be wondering, why is it that I only use app that get name and I end up getting two methods? I have the get method, and the head method for HTTP for this one route. So clearly, this is what Fiber is doing. And we're not going to dive into why just yet. We'll just accept that this is what's happening. The nice thing, though, is now that we've enabled print routes, we can see all the routes that we have configured, which methods, which path, the name if there's any, and the handler. So that's pretty nice. So that's something that I think we should keep also, especially while we're developing our application. Um, this is useful information. Now, do you want to keep this turned on when you build out your application or you go to production? I don't think so, because if you're building a really complex application, you might have tons of endpoints, and this might just be a lot of information. All right. The next thing I want to show is the server name. But before I show that, let's take a look at our response. So down at the bottom right of my screen, you can see that when I make a request, I get back this response. It's essentially three lines. 
it tell me the HTTP version. It tell me the HTTP status, which is 200, which means OK. So that's that first line. The second line is the content length, how much data I got back, which is response length, essentially. So zero, because we didn't say anything. And then it gives the date. But notice, those are the three things that I have that comes back. So look what happened when I set a value of a server header. So I can say that oh, this application is maybe running on a specific server, um, or this is the service. So when I set the server header to a value, and now I make a request, you'll see that uh, my request response include a server header with that value. So what might be a use for this value or setting this value? Let's say I have several instances of my application running. And so of course they're running on different hosts and I put a load balancer in front of those instances. When I make a request, I don't know which one of those instances I, I would, my request was routed to. But if each instance would populate or send back in the server header or set this value to the host on which it's running, now that can help me debug like which instance of the application is responding. And just to show you how um, the client also uses something like this. If I send my request with minus V for verbos, you'll see that in the request that the client sent, there's this user agent value that is usually sent by clients. This basically says, this is the name of the client who sent it. So here we have HTTP IE, but if I was using curl, it would put, put use curl. If it's a browser, it would say which browser it was just Firefox, you know, Chrome, etc. All right, so let's move on. So you remember I talked about this pre-fork, right? So let's set pre-fork to true and see what happened. And so you see when my application rebuilds, it doesn't render properly. That's because this terminal inside of you know my editor doesn't always render like um, those characters, those fancy characters for you know formatting. But if I go back to the terminal here and I actually run it outside of my editor, well, of course I have to be in the right directory. So I'm going to cd into example zero one. So I have to cd into the correct directory. Um, I can now run the program um, directly in my terminal instead of within the VS Code editor. Um, and so if I do that, you'll see now that pre-fork is now set to enable, whereas before it was disabled. And you can see all these child PIDs, no process IDs. These are the PIDs or the child PIDs for the parent process. The parent process is 126. But the child PID are all those other values. And that is why that function fiber that is child is useful so that though you can check and see which one of those you're in, whether you're the parent or you're in a child, if that's important for you to know. And so this is how you would use pre-fork. Now, the documentation for pre-fork talks about in order for it to work properly, it needs to be started from a shell. So if you use in pre-fork in like a Docker container, for example, and you build a Docker image, you want to be able to use your, make sure that the command to start your application is actually a shell command. If this doesn't make any sense, look at the documentation. But once again, for like the fifth time, I don't think most people are going to use prefork. I just sort of wanted to show you what prefork is, what it does, and show you how that function that is um, exposed by the package, the fiber package, why it's there. So, that's essentially it. Like I said, I don't think um, most of these properties that are provided in the config will, most people would need to use them, but those are some that I think that you would, that would come in handy um, and that you might want to use. There are other ones in there like the size of the, um, the request body in case, for example, you wanted to build an application that uploads a file and it, the default is set to four megs. And if you build a application where somebody's trying to post a file that is bigger than four megs, you'll see it all request too large, in which case you want to increase that um, body limit parameter. And it's right there in the config. But I think those are things that most people don't have to set. And then if you do, you're gonna definitely have a clear indication that, oh, 
um, I need to go check and see if there's a value that I need to configure because something is not working. But for the most part, 90% of the time, I think just the defaults are going to work just fine. And if the, you turn on the few that I'm showing you or set these few values I'm showing you, it just helps you during development. So that's it for this video. I wanted to make it nice and short. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about the immutable property in the config um, value. We didn't talk about it in this video because I specifically want to leave that to talk about in one video because it's so important and we'll deal with it there. Um, there's some other properties that have to do with the view and templates and I didn't talk about those again because we have future videos in which we're going to talk about you know the template middleware and views and so I figured it's best to deal with those there. Okay, if you've made it this far and you're a subscriber, thank you so much. If you're not a subscriber, what are you waiting for? You've watched the end of the video. I hope you like what you see. Please consider subscribing. I would love to have you as a subscriber. So please just hit the subscribe button before you leave. And if you have question, concern, comment, anything, please drop it below. Please thumbs up the video. That really helps with the visibility and the engagement. So even if you don't have anything to say, just subscribe and thumbs up the video. At least that minimum, please, please do that. Um, if definitely if you have questions or comments, please post. If you just like to say thank you, please just post a comment. Uh, I try and read all the comments. I try to respond. Um, finally, there are a number of ways in which you could support the channel if you are able to. Uh, I have a Tesla referral link. If you know anybody who is looking to get anything from Tesla, please give them my Tesla referral link. I would appreciate it. And plus there are some other ways and you know with Patreon, you can do that too or digital currency. Um, thanks again for your support. Thanks for watching the video to the end. Take care, stay safe, and see you. Bye.